Good morning students, uh, today is lecture 29 under module 10. In today's lecture, we will discuss basically the perevaporation, uh, its principle, advantages, membrane and modules, mass transfer uh, uh, in perevaporation, different applications of perevaporation as well as hybrid distillation and perevaporation systems. Now, let us start with. So, uh, pervaporation actually means permeate evaporation or permeate vaporization. That means, the permeate when it is coming down and the permeate side is getting vaporized by uh, uh, some means that we will see uh, of course. So, um, a little history about uh, pervaporation. So, pervaporation process can be traced back to 19th century, but the word pervaporation was first coined by Kobe in 1917. The process was systematically uh, studied by Binning and co-workers at American Oil in 1950s. Uh, membrane technology at that time could not produce high performance membranes and modules uh, required for commercially competitive processes. Uh, the process was picked in 1970s by Monsanto, by Ellie Perry and others. Interestingly, between 1973 to 80s, dozens of patents were assigned to Monsanto covering wide variety of pervaporation application. However, none of these work led to commercialization. By 1980s, advances in membrane technology made it possible to prepare economically viable pervaporation systems. So, uh, pervaporation is a membrane separation process which uses a dense polymeric membrane for selective permeation of one or more components from a liquid mixture. Now, in this process a pure liquid or liquid mixture is in contact with the membrane on the feed side as is well in for other membrane systems and at atmospheric pressure and the permeate is removed as a vapor. So, that is very important permeate is removed as a vapor because of low vapor pressure that is existing on the permeate or downstream side. Now, this low vapor pressure uh, can be achieved by employing a carrier gas or by using a vacuum pump. So, you can uh, achieve it by two means. So, uh, the partial downstream pressure must be lower than the saturation pressure at least so that the vaporization takes place. Now, let us see the schematic diagram you will understand it better. So, this is the pervaporation system here pervaporation membranes. Okay. So, you can see here in the first one the permeate vaporization is achieved using a vacuum pump. Okay. So, permeate is being drawn and it is condensed and it is it is done by a vacuum pump. So, here in this second case the low vapor pressure is being uh, maintained by using a carrier gas. So, one uh, carrier gas is being fed uh, to the downstream side or to the permeate side. So, the low vapor pressure maintains and then we have to condense at the permeate and then finally, draw it. So, these are two uh, classic schemes of the pervaporation system by two means you can achieve the, the pervaporation uh, one by vacuum pump another by uh, carrier gas. The principle of evapor pervaporation is better understood through the explanation of a two step process. The first is evaporation, the second is membrane transfer. So, in evaporation process, the temperature of the feed liquid is elevated to the point where a saturated vapor is formed. So, basically you are heating the feed to a certain point where the vapor is getting formed. So, when that heated vapor enters the apparatus, the saturated vapor comes in contact with the membrane. Then in the second step, it is membrane mass transfer. So, in the membrane transfer process, the vapor diffuses from the feed side across the membrane to the permeate side a condenser is installed on the permeate side to create a pressure lower than the feed side. The vapor permeate is at least partially condensed to produce a liquid product. So, you have just seen that in both the systems we have condensers. So, the con job of the condenser is to condense the vapor and produce a liquid. Any uncondensable vapor is usually small. The pumping required for this method is frequently minor. The mass flux is due to the continuous adsorption on one side of the membrane and desorption on the other side. Pervaporation process essentially involves three main steps. First is selective sorption into the membrane on the feed side. Then second is selective diffusion through the membrane and third is desorption into a vapor phase on the permeate side. These are the three basic essential steps that is required for the pervaporation. Uh, theoretically, pervaporation is the most complicated membrane separation process as both heat and mass transfer occurs. On the liquid side, concentration polarization may be important particularly for the removal of trace organics from water. The membranes operate by a solution diffusion mechanism. Since the polymer becomes highly swollen on the liquid side and dries on the vapor side, the diffusivity varies considerably across the membrane. The evaporation at the vapor side has a major effect on the observed selectivity. Actually, when the polymer uh, gets swollen, 
right. Uh, so, that is also not good and the diffusivity will vary if the polymer or the membrane gets swollen. So, that will affect the selectivity also. So, for the separation of trace organics from water, the relative volatility of trace organics is often very high even through the boiling point of the water. So, because of evaporation, the process becomes non-thermal, uh, the temperature change affects solubility, diffusivity and evaporation. In pervaporation process, the transport can be best described by means of a solution diffusion mechanism. We have discussed solution diffusion in detail earlier in one of our class. So, I am not uh, going to tell you anything more on this. Just to remind you that solution diffusion is a system mechanism through which the transport happens in uh, non-porous membranes as well as in this case of pervaporation system where solubility and diffusivity both are very important or both play a vital role. In fact, the same type of membrane or membrane material can be used for both gas separation or pervaporation. That is what I was just telling really non porous membranes. However, the affinity of a liquid towards polymer is generally much higher than that of a gas in polymer. So, the solubility is much higher. So, when we talk about a liquid phase separation and a gas phase separation, the affinity of liquid all uh, towards a polymer is obviously much more higher than that of the gas. So, that is why when the affinity is more, the solubility is also more. So, in gas separation, the selectivity toward a mixture can be estimated from the ratio of the permeability coefficient of the pure gases. However, with liquid mixture, the separation characteristics are far different than those of a pure liquid because of thermodynamic interactions. Now, let us try to understand the basic difference between distillation and pervaporation. Please look at this particular figure. So, this is a in distillation, you know distillation uh, the major driving force is your uh, vapor liquid equilibrium which is given by this particular uh, this one uh, figure and uh, pervaporation is one in which the differences is, differences in diffusivity and solubility plays a big role. So, you can see this uh, in case of distillation uh, there is no other uh, the material uh, is not playing a big role whereas, in pervaporation the material of the membrane is playing a big role. Right. So, pervaporation due to the presence of liquid and vapor phase looks like uh, that of a extractive distillation actually. So, where in extractive distillation we are putting a third uh, solvent or an entrainer. Okay. So, that uh, the phase master spore will happen to that particular entrainer then you can selectively take it out. Uh, whereas, in case of pervaporation the uh, third component the is nothing but the membrane itself here and the pervaporation characteristics is determined by the choice of the membrane material whereas, it is exclusively vapor liquid equilibrium in case of the distillation. So, uh, in this particular figure, uh, this is a classic example of distillation and pervaporation for an ethanol water mixture at 20 degree centigrade. So, pervaporation was carried out using a polyacrylonitrile membrane. The solubility of gases in polymeric material can be described by Henry's law when T is less than Tg, Tg is the glass transition temperature. The much higher the solubility of liquids implies that Henry's law is no longer obeyed and the flory huggins theory is commonly used to provide an adequate description of the solubility of liquid mixture and pure liquids into a polymeric material. So, when Henry's law is not applicable, you can use the flory huggins theory. The permeability of a given component I uh, from a mixture of components I and J can be expressed as a function of diffusivity and solubility. So, with liquids the main difference from gases is that uh, diffusivity and solubility are not constant, but are strongly dependent on the feed composition. So, you can write P i equals to D i C i C j into S C i C j. So, D i is your diffusivity and S is your solubility. If another component K is taken instead of a component J, so both the diffusivity D i and the solubility S i are changed. So, if polyvinyl alcohol is used for the separation of ethanol water mixtures, two compositions can be distinguished. One is a low water concentration, another is a low alcohol concentration. So, with this low alcohol concentration, the membrane hardly swells and hardly any selectivity is obtained. So, membrane is not getting swell that is fine, but the selectivity that is what you are trying to achieve you will not get. So, with lower water concentration, this same polymer may show high selectivity towards water and exhibits a reasonable flux. Now, another important example is that of a mixture which consists of two components which are not miscible with each other over the whole composition range as for example, trichloroethylene water. So, this is a system in which both this trichloroethylene and water are not completely miscible. So, pervaporation can be used to remove a small amount of water from trichloroethylene or can remove small amount of trichloroethylene from water. So, this is the beauty of pervaporation system. In a mixture of two components, either selectively you can uh, remove any one of these two. 
So, if silicon rubber is used as a membrane material to remove small amounts of trichloroethylene from water, excellent result is obtained whereas if the same membrane is used for separation of water from pure trichloroethylene, the membrane is swollen which eventually results loss in terms of mechanical and separation properties. From this statement what is understood is that the membrane material plays a very big role. When we are using uh, polyvinyl alcohol that time the membrane is getting swelled, when I am using silicon rubber the membrane is not getting much swelled and I am getting a desirable flux and a very good separation properties. So, thus in order to remove traces of water another material has to be chosen as for example, polyvinyl alcohol. So, these extreme examples indicate the influence of composition on the pervaporation performance. The transport of liquid mixtures through a polymeric membrane is generally much more complex. In the case of a binary liquid mixture, the flux can also be described in terms of the solubility and diffusivity, but in such a way that they can have a strong on influence on each other. Now, two phenomena can be distinguished in a multi-component transport. One is flow coupling, long back when you discuss thermodynamics. So, flow coupling is best described in terms of non-equilibrium thermodynamics and accounts for the fact that transport of a component is affected due to the gradient of other component. So, in a nutshell, you try to remember flow coupling you just try to understand that in a multi component system there are many components are trying to diffuse together or trying to get separated. So, one component will try to affect the gradient of another component. So, this is what is actually coupling. Now, there can be positive coupling or negative coupling depending upon what type of components and what is their diffusivity and solubility and all these things. Okay. And in the thermodynamic interaction is a much more important phenomenon. Due to the interaction of one component, the membranes become more accessible for the other components since the membrane becomes more swollen. So, diffusional resistance decreases. For pervaporation and gas separation, non-porous membranes are required preferably with an anisotropic morphology that means an asymmetric structure with a dense top layer and a porous sub layer as found in the asymmetric and composite membranes. The requirements for the substructure are in fact the same as for gas separation membranes. So, an open substructure to minimize resistance to vapor transport and to avoid capillary condensation and a high surface porosity with narrow pore size distribution. Uh, pressure loss on the permeate side results in an increase in partial pressure and hence in a decrease in driving force and flux. So, when the pores are too small, the pressure loss may be so high that even capillary condensation may occur. Now, please understand that capillary condensation phenomena also we have discussed, but capillary condensation is not actually desired in case of pervaporation. On the other hand, if the pores in the support layers are too large, it is difficult to apply a thin selective layer directly upon the support. So, you need some optimization actually basically what type of pores you need and how you will get it. In addition, it is very important that the surface porosity should be high. Now, hence it may be useful to consider a three layer membrane. This is what is telling us that we need a three layer membrane. So, consisting of a very porous substructure shows no resistance with a non-selective intermediate layer placed on this uh, followed by a tons dense uh, top layer. So, three important techniques for preparation of gas separation and vapor permeation membranes. So, one is deep coating, another is plasma polymerization and then interfacial polymerization. Now, you know all these techniques we have discussed in detail. So, I am not going to discuss here in this particular pervaporation section. Now, you can go back and read and refurbish here this one uh, knowledge. Uh, so, the choice of polymeric material depends strongly on the type of application. So, what is the type of application actually when you are removing organic compounds then the then different type of polymer material has to be chosen. If you are doing like other component separation which is not organic then maybe uh, the polymeric material that you will choose maybe it will be different. So, uh, depending upon the type of application only you will decide which polymeric material has to be chosen. So, in contrast to gas separation elastomers are generally no more permeable than glassy polymers because of the much higher affinity of liquids their solubility is much higher with the high penetrant concentration exerting a plasticizing effect on the segmental motion in the polymer chain resulting in an enhanced permeation rate. In fact, because of the high swelling, uh, the TG value uh, is reduced with the result that a glassy polymer may behave as an elastomer if the application temperature is above the glass transition temperature. So, some important aspects of pervaporation, the membrane should not swell too much otherwise the selectivity will decrease drastically. On the other hand, low surfson or swelling will result in a very low flux. So, you need to play within this uh, and you have to actually optimize the parameters and uh, hence the optimum uh, is somewhere in between and as a rough estimate an overall surfson value of about 5 to 20 percent by weight is useful. 
then it is not necessary that the polymers are cross linked or crystalline it is even better to use amorphous that is glacier rubbery polymers because crystallinity has a negative effect or influence on the permeation rate the cross linked polymers should be used in those cases where the polymeric membranes swell excessively and where a cross linked membrane shows good performance otherwise we don't need actually cross linking we are fine with a glacier rubbery polymers because as i just told you the crystallinity as such has a negative influence on the permeation rate uh, uh, some major advantages of pervaporation involves so with the um, lower temperature and pressure involves in pervaporation it often has less cost and performance advantages for the separation of agiotropic mixtures and mixtures of components with close boiling points. So, uh, PV is extremely good to separate agiotropes as well as close boiling point mixtures. Now, the technology minimizes the thermal degradation of heat, sens heat sensitive compounds such as flavor essence. Significantly, we do not need a high temperature. So, that is why pervaporation is good for flavoring uh, compounds or heat sensitive compounds. Significantly reduced energy consumption for hybrid system as in pervaporation combined with distillation this we will discuss later in today's class only. So, no entrainer is required thereby no contamination. So, I am now not adding anything unlike your um, extractive distillation. So, not, no extra additional component is added. Due to modular design of membrane system even small units can operate economically. Pervaporation uses no servants which needs to be uh, regenerated. Pervaporation is a continuous process and offers immediate recovery of solvents for industrial application. High degree of flexibility regarding the feed mixtures that may be accommodated, uh, multipurpose systems, then various feed mixtures can be treated in single unit. So, you can design a module smaller, big or medium does not matter. So, in such a way that and modules design and the process and the entire PV system is not very complicated. So, that is why uh, small units also runs very successfully as well as large units. So, let us now try to understand the mass transfer in pervaporation. So, pervaporation consists of the following 5 steps if in sequential order. In the first step, the transfer of component from feed solution to the surface of the membrane. So, if you consider this as the membrane surface and uh, this is the bulk, let us say this is the component. So, the transfer of component from the bulk okay, to the surface of the membrane, then it is coming and sitting here. Then selective surfacing. Okay, or dissolution of the component in the membrane surface. Since uh, this has to be dissolved in the membrane surface, so it will get dissolved in the membrane surface. So, once it get dissolved, then it will try to diffuse. Okay. So, diffusion and transport or permeation of the component through the membrane. So, then once it reaches the permeate side, then it will dissolve. Okay. So, it dissolves in the form of, so this is here, this is liquid, this is vapor phase. Okay. So, dissolve in the form of uh, vapor. So, then this vapor when it goes to a condenser, okay, so it condenses and we get the liquid. Okay. So, transfer of the component from the membrane surface to the bulk of the permeate. Okay. So, five, uh, five essential steps uh, is how the mass transfer in pervaporation takes place. The first and the last step is usually the first and takes place at equilibrium. And diffusion on the other hand is a kinetic and slower process. So, permeation is dependent on the surfacing and diffusion processes. Selectivity in pervaporation is generally controlled by relative surfacing of the component being separated. Now, major parameters involved in surfacing and diffusion steps are temperature, pressure, concentration, molecular weight, size and shape of the molecules polymers and penetrant compatibility, reticulation level, crystallinity of the polymeric materials. So, all this you know there are big list of parameters they are trying to influence the process dynamics. So, you need to optimize all these things. So, subsorption involves thermodynamic aspects, molecular mobility within the polymer due to low pressure on the permeate side and the desorption step is normally the fastest one and does not contribute much to the overall mass transfer resistance. So, your mass flux across the membrane can be described as a partial pressure difference between the saturated vapor pressure and the permeate vapor pressure. As the permeate such, uh, pressure decreases and approaches the feed pressure, the flux increases to 0 in a linear manner. Also, the temperature is an important factor in this flux. As temperature of the feed increases, the system is able to handle a higher flux of water. The final separation of the feed liquid is the product of the separation uh, achieved by the evaporation of the liquid and the separation is achieved by the permeation through the membrane. So, 
membranes for the pervaporation process. The choice of membrane for the process of the pervaporation depends on the feed solution and uh, of course, as well as I forgot to mention as well as your intended application where you are going to apply. The performance of membrane is determined by the degree of separation of fluid mixture uh, and the permeation rate that is flux. Membranes used for pervaporation processes are classified according to the nature of the separation being performed. So, hydrophilic membranes are used to remove water from organic solutions. These membranes are typically made up of polymer having glass transition temperature above room temperature. For example, your polyvinyl alcohol. And then organophilic membranes are used to remove organics, okay, organophilic membranes. Right. So, these membranes are typically made up of elastomer polymer. So, for these polymers, their glass transition temperature is always below room temperature. The flexible nature of these polymers makes them ideal for allowing organic substances to pass through. For a few examples include nitrile, then your butadiene rubber, styrene butadiene rubber that is SBR. So, because of their hydrophilic character, these membranes enable the extraction of water with fluxes and selectivity depending upon the chemical structure of the active layer and its mode of cross-linking. A great majority of the commercially available hydrophilic membranes are made up polyvinyl alcohol thermally or chemically cross-linked by special agents to provide chemical resistance in the acid media or in strongly solvating media. Composite membranes are nowadays taking a lot of attention, actually gaining a lot of attention. Now, these membranes consist of two layers. The first layer is porous polymeric support coated with a second polymer, the active or perm selective layer. The membrane separation characteristic can be further refined by varying the thickness of the perm selective layer. For example, the asymmetric composite hydrophilic membrane such as composite polyvinyl alcohol polysulfon are used for pervaporation. Then the modules. Now, pervaporation uh, separation plants contain between 10 to 100 meter square of membrane area which must be packed efficiently and economically into units called membrane modules. Now, most commonly membrane modules are there are two types basically. So, either you can have a flat sheet membrane module or you can have spiral loon membrane module. Now, students you know we have discussed flat sheet membrane module and spiral loon membrane module in detail when we discuss membrane modules and thereafter also we have discussed during our ultrafiltration, microfiltration and RO system about the flat sheet and spiral loon membrane module. So, their advantages, their characteristic features mostly they remain same, right. So, the spiral is a better one, why because it gives high membrane surface area per module and allows for relatively high feed flow rate. So, silicon rubber based pervaporation modules are remarkably effective for separating organic solutes from dilute aqueous solution because silicon rubber is not getting swelled. So, that is why it is very good, its performance is good for organics. Removal. The use of dense membrane has initially inhibited the growth of pervaporation due to the high membrane thickness which results in low permeate fluxes. Now, let us discuss the pervaporation membrane module design. So, for a binary system, the schematic diagram of pervaporation system is given below. So, this is you see feed, okay. And then we have this is uh, your product are written it out. So, a permeate here, okay. So, F i n, F l and F p are the flow rates in moles per hour and x out and y p are the mole fraction of the more permeable component. Please remember more permeable component. So, let us see uh, the equations. So, if you defining the stage cut theta, so theta equal to F b by F i n, the mass balance can be written as x out equals to z minus theta y p divided by 1 minus theta. So, selectivity data that is in terms of relative volatility we can write alpha a b prime equals to y a by x a divided by y b by x b. So, no, we can rewrite as y a into 1 minus y a divided by x a into 1 minus y a. Then solving for y we will get y equals to alpha a b into x divided by 1 plus alpha a b prime minus 1 into x. Now, you know for a complete mixing system your y p becomes y and your x out becomes x. So, you can sus just substitute in these equations then equation 3 becomes y p equals to alpha a b prime x out divided by 1 plus alpha a b prime minus 1 into x out. Now, these equations 1 and 5 can be combined as and you will get z something like this It's a big equation I am just not reading it out. So, this equation you will be using to find out what is z. So, these equations can be solved by trial and error procedures. So, for example, you can write a small code in any language <laughs> and solve it. Uh, let us say for example, if z and theta are given we can proceed as follows. So, step 1 decide x out guess by guessing you have to guess the x out value right determine a alpha a b prime and x out from the data 
calculate y p from the solution of equation 6, calculate x out calculator from equation 1 and check if x out guess equals to x out calculation calculator. So, if your x out guess, guess value is equals to x out calculator value and uh, then it is fine, if it is not then return to the step 1. So, the cycle again repeats. So, this is how you can uh, solve the uh, equations. So, for the given system, the energy balance can be written is F i n C p i n into T i n minus T out equals to F out C p l T out minus T reference plus F p into C p v T p minus T reference plus lambda. Now, here is lambda is the latent heat of vaporization. So, with thermal equilibrium in a completely mixed system, we are assuming completely mixed system T p equals to T out. Right. So, uh, since the reference temperature is arbitrary, we can write that T reference is equal to T p equals to T out. Then uh, the energy balance simplifies to F i n C p i n T i n minus T out equals to F p into lambda. So, we can get theta, we can rewrite it by taking i n and C p i n that side. So, you can F and F it is actually get cancelled. So, it is theta T in minus T out equals to theta lambda divided by C p i n or from here we can calculate theta equals to T i n minus T out C p i n by lambda. So, the high temperature T i n is limited by the stability of the membrane, the low temperature T out equals to T p is limited by the need to have a vapor on the permeate side. So, thus if T p is decreased very low pressure may be uh, required, since latent heat are significantly greater than specific heats, the amount of energy required to vaporize the permeate will not be available in the feed unless the permeate flow rate is low. For removal of trace organics, permeate rates will be low and sufficient energy is usually available in the feed. Now, let us understand what are the factors that affect the pervaporation system or process. So, we are discussing major factors, so feed composition and concentration. So, a change in the feed composition directly affects the absorption phenomena at the liquid membrane surface. So, this can be proved by the solution diffusion principle and as the diffusion of the component in the membrane, uh, a diffusion of the uh, diffusion of the components in the membrane is dependent on the concentration of the components, the permeation characteristics are hence dependent on the feed concentration as well. And the second is feed and permeate pressure. So, here the pressure, it is not a pressure driven system. Uh, so, if the pressure, uh, the driving force in pervaporation is the partial pressure difference of the components which in turn is dependent on the activity gradient of the components at the downstream side of the membrane and it is strongly influences the pervaporation characteristics. So, it is not externally pressure driven basically. So, the maximum gradient can be obtained for zero permeate pressure and thus for higher permeate pressures uh, the feed pressure influences the pervaporation characteristics. Then temperature. So, as the temperature of the feed increases, uh, the permeation rate uh, generally follows an uh, Arrhenius type equation. The selectivity is strongly dependent on uh, temperature and in most cases uh, a small decrease in selectivity is observed with increasing temperature. So, now let us uh, try to see the different types of possible PV configuration, I will try to uh, draw it uh, for you. So, uh, we can uh, we have actually 6 different types of configurations. So, the first one is this. So, let us say we have a um, membrane here, pervaporation membrane, right. So, we have a feed here. So, we will get retentate here. So, we are getting permeate here, ok. So, this is vacuum driven P V. This is one type, the uh, usual general uh, one basically, ok. So, then we have temperature driven, the second one is temperature driven P V. So, here again we have a membrane, evaporation membrane, then we have a feed. Now, the feed is getting heated, ok. So, this is your heat source, right. So, um, I forgot to wrote this is liquid here, liquid here, vapor here, vapor here, ok. So, you get your retentate here and your condenser and permeate, ok. So, this is condenser, right. So, this is uh, another one where the feed is actually heated, 
Okay. So, this is temperature driven pervaporation. So, uh, next type is uh, pervaporation with condensable and immiscible carrier. So, P V with condensable and immiscible carrier. So, let us see the pervaporation membrane. Okay. P Retentet. Okay. So, permit. Okay. So, this is a evaporator, this is a decanter. Okay, and this is your condenser. So, what is extra you can see here? So, here the condenser is actually condensing the liquid that it goes to a decanter and then that liquid is being evaporated and again recycled back. So, that is your carrier. Okay. So, it is a um, condensable and immiscible carrier. Okay. Now, there is another one which is called pervaporation with carrier gas pervaporation only plain carrier gas okay so this is the membrane feed then we get here retentate okay so this is your non condensable carrier. Okay. Now, the basic difference between uh, these two system is there here in this case. Okay. So, there is a immiscible, but condensable carrier, but in the second case which is usually more preferred uh, or practice. So, this is a non condensable carrier gas. So, we do not need to condense it, we can just remove the permeate liquid and then again uh, recycle it back to the pervaporation system. So, two more systems. So, um, that is called PV with condensable and miscible carrier. It is condensable, but now it is miscible. Okay. So, here your PV system right feed is coming here, okay. return that you get here. So, what you have is a condenser, then we get permeate here. So, this is a evaporator part of the retentate is bit fed back through the evaporator system okay. and then send it back to the pervaporation system. So, then the next one is P V with a two phase permeate and partial recycle. So, let us see how this looks like feed here retented. So, then it goes to a condenser from condenser it comes to a decanter just like the second one ok right. So, we get a uh, permeate liquid here okay, and the rest is being recycled. It is partial recycle that is why it is called partial recycle and it is uh, pervaporation with a two phase permeate and a, a partial recycle system. So, you just saw six different types of configurations that is possible using for pervaporation. So, the next one actually is a classic example of uh, uh, pervaporation configuration and how do you improve the separation right. So, um, for a 0 0.5 percent ethanol mixture that we want to enrich actually. Okay. So, 
in a pervaporation system. So, you will have so this is your feed then you get 0.5 percent ET OH then whatever it is getting coming it is enriched to 20 percent ET OH ethanol. So, then it passes to fractional condensations. Okay. So, you get condensed here. So, whatever it is coming is again passing through another stage of condensation, then we get a 50 percent rich ET OH ethanol okay. and whatever is remaining it again goes to the feed. So, this is 6 percent ET OH. So, you see that if you do not have this two okay, only pervaporation, so you get a 20 percent ethanol. Whereas, if you are attaching fractional condensation, so it is P V with two stage fractional condensation. Okay. So, in two stage fractional condensation, of course, you are achieving a 50 percent ethanol. So, this is how you actually improve the performance. Okay, so, let us go ahead and discuss the applications of pervaporation. So, membrane pervaporation uh, has emerged as an effective and energy efficient process for the separation of liquid mixtures in chemical process industries, particularly for uh, energy intensive, azeotropic, closely boiling and temperature sensitive liquid mixtures. So, the selectivity of pervaporation is generally high making it promising for a number of separations particularly where conventional separation processes results in high specific investment cost. So, a combination of membrane pervaporation with conventional processes sometimes offer economical advantage. Pervaporation has a large list of industrial applications for the separation of liquid mixtures. Although it is a developing industrial membrane separation process, but still its leading perspectives have compelled the industrialists to fabricate pervaporation plants which are effectively playing their role in production. So, typical separations are that is being conducted using pervaporation is the first is foremost is the separation of azeotropes okay, in chemical process industries, then organic organic separations, separation of dissolved organics from water very important applications, separations that is being carried out downstream uh, site in petroleum and petrochemical industries, then increasing distillation column efficiency by hybrid pervaporation unit this we will discuss. Okay. So, increasing reaction yield by perstillation of and water and wastewater treatment etcetera. So, one example is dehydration of azeotropic mixture. Now, pervaporation process is used mainly to separate or remove small amount of liquid from a liquid mixture. Now, when highly selective membranes are used, only the heat of vaporization of the most almost pure permeate has to be supplied. Now, this separation becomes very attractive when the liquid mixture exhibits an azeotropic composition where the liquid and vapor have same composition. The distillation process cannot be used to separate such mixtures. Mixtures of an organic solvent with water exhibit as an azeotropic with water exhibit an azeotrope in the composition region of the pure organic solvent. Hence, it is very advantageous to use pervaporation to dehydrate these types of mixtures. So, this table lists some of these mixtures with their corresponding azeotropic composition. So, water and uh, ethanol the forms a azeotrope at uh, 4.4 and 95.6. So, similarly other uh, it is given water isopropanol, butanol, and dioxin, aceton, hexane and all these things. So, there are many binary mixtures where the azeotrope is not located at one of the pure component, but somewhere in the middle. So, this is actually the problem. So, in these cases it is not very advantageous to use pervaporation for complete separation. However, a combination of pervaporation and distillation can be applied in such cases where pervaporation is used to break the azeotrope. So, then you can distill it off once the azeotrope is uh, broken. So, in such hybrid processes the actual separation is performed by the distillation and pervaporation is only applied to shift the composition from the azeotrope. The employment of hybrid processing the combination of two or more separation processes is mainly uh, in many cases much more advantageous in terms of investment uh, that is basically the capital investment and the energy consumption of course, the operating cost. So, this is a classical example of separation of a 50 50 azeotropic mixture. So, what is this being done? It is a hybrid distillation and pervaporation system. What is this being done is AB azeotrope is fed to pervaporation. Now, what this pervaporation system will do? 
it will break the isotrope and make a pure A and or a pure B or you cannot do not say pure A pure B, let us say uh, enriched A and enriched B. Now, one fraction goes to one distillation column, another fraction goes to another distillation column. So, then in both the distillation columns, uh, we will get a pure fractions of A and pure fractions of B and whatever remains is being fed back to the original azeotropic mixture to the AB. Uh, AB. So, let, let us have a look. So, AB azeotropes in being separated in a pervaporation system. So, we get enriched A here and we get enriched B here. So, the enriched A is fed to the distillation column 1. Okay. So, here we get a pure A and this is bandage B comes to the distillation column 2, we will get a pure B. So, whatever is left out azeotropes is being fed and recycled back to the feed. So, this is a classic example of how you treat a 50 50 azeotropic mixture. So, please remember here the job of uh, pervaporation is shifting the azeotrope, it is breaking the azeotrope, it is not making pure A and pure B. The pure A and pure B are being made in the corresponding distillation columns. So, this is another classic example where this is pervaporation is coupled with a distillation system for the separation of closed boiling point mixtures. So, you can see uh, here we have one distillation column and pervaporation let us this is a more uh, beautiful hybrid system here AB mixture is being fit to the mid of the column then uh, this is being little heated here in the distillation column is a feed tray then it goes to the pervaporation where it is breaking this uh, mixture into a enriched pure and uh, enriched A. So, this is actually enriched A and this is enriched B. Okay. So, enriched A and enriched B are being fed back to the distillation column as separate uh, trays. Okay. Now, you will get a pure A from the top side and you get a pure B from the bottom side. So, you see here in this particular case, we have a single distillation column and, uh, and a single pervaporation system that is enough to uh, separate the close boiling point mixtures to pure components. So, these are actually uh, being adapted in uh, industries also commercially uh, practiced. So, these are potential configurations of some pervaporation distillation hybrid process. So, you can see ethanol and water mixture. So, uh, ethanol water is being fed to the distillation column okay. from the top side uh, the, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, the ratio or the feed that goes to the pervaporation system uh, you get a pure ethanol here and whatever is left out is being recycled back. So, that is nothing but your water. So, in the second case your methanol and C4 MTBE is being mixture is being treated. Okay. So, you get in the pervaporation what it is separating your meth methanol okay. and your C4 and M MTBE is being fed back, it is not getting separated in pervaporation. So, the distillation column is separating your C4 and MTB into two different and distinct fractions. Similarly, benzene and cyclohexane azeotrope classic example, okay, the pervaporation is breaking, this is the one the first one which we saw actually for 50 50 azeotrope. Okay. So, um, pervaporation is breaking the benzene and cyclohexane azeotrope. So, cyclohexane enriched component here is being fed to the distillation column uh, here. So, you get a pure cyclohexane and then um, benzene rich uh, uh, fraction. Okay. So, this is benzene rich fraction uh, is being fed to this column. So, you get a pure benzene here and the azeotrope is being recycled back. This is how uh, we will have different configurations of hybrid distillation and pervaporation systems. So, then another example is dehydration of alcohol. So, one of the most important application of pervaporation is dehydration of ethyl alcohol. So, a fermentation broth usually contains 5 to 10 percent of ethyl alcohol. In the conventional process, it is concentrated and dehydrated using distillation. However, ethyl alcohol forms an azeotrope with water at ethyl alcohol concentration of 96.5 weight percent and distillation becomes ineffective for removing the trace amount of water. Now, as a result, pervaporation was developed by GFT in Germany it been 1970s. So, this has been attractive and economic uh, alternative. So, it uses an asymmetric composite membrane consisting of three layers. Okay. So, there is a non-weaven polyester support on which a polyacrylonitrile or polysulfon ultrafiltration membrane is casted. So, on top of ultrafiltration membrane layer an ultra thin layer of cross-linked polyvinyl alcohol uh, membrane is uh, grafted. So, the hydrophilic PVA layer allows preferential permeation of water through it and leaves dehydrated alcohol as retentor. So, this is the example how um, uh, the combined distillation and pervaporation system is uh, performing uh, your uh, separation of 
you are doing the dehydration of alcohol. So, you know another classic example is control of ethanol concentration in fermenter. So, to establish a continuous uh, fermentation process, the ethanol concentration within the fermentation vessel should be kept 5 percent by weight. See, ethanol is continuously being produced by the microorganisms inside the fermenter. Okay. And if you are not, it is a batch process, if you are not even in continuous process, if you are not removing the ethanol, that the ethanol concentration is increasing. Now, that additional ethanol beyond 5 percent which was found out that up to 5 percent it is fine will become toxic to the microorganism thereby inhibiting the growth and their performance. So, there will be no more ethanol form formation. So, this has to be removed. So, pervaporation has been widely used to maintain the necessary ethanol concentration in the broth. The advantage of using pervaporation in this type of system is that the ease of processing uh, the clean and nearly pure ethanol extracted from fermentation vessel. So, you get a extremely pure ethanol directly we are getting a pure ethanol just by using a pervaporation system and a significantly higher fermentation capacity or the reduction of fermentation fermenter size and cost. Then concentration and recovery of flavor and fragrances. Pervaporation is used to recover any lost juice solution during evaporation. The vapor from evaporation process is further processed using pervaporation. The recovered concentrated apple juice retain its aromatic and taste qualities. Membrane system are used to recover natural fiber and fragrance compounds produced in a wide variety of food processing applications. Typical process streams include orange juice evaporator condensate, tomato hot break evaporator condensate and onion juice condensate. So, this is a schematic diagram of experimental pervaporation apparatus for concentration of aroma compound from soluble coffee. So, from the coffee you are extracting the aroma compound. So, you can see that there are many components the one is the temperature control bath, this is the feed tank okay. uh, then 3 is the diaphragm pump, 4 is the membrane module. So, this is the pervaporation module okay. and then 5 is the liquid nitrogen, this is the liquid nitrogen cold traps, 6 is a flow meter, 7 is a vacuum pump, 8 is temperature indicator and 9 is digital pressure indicator. So, uh, you can see that how in a particular uh, integrated system the flavor uh, or the aroma compound from the soluble coffee is being extracted okay, without compromising its properties. Another example is removal of VOCs. VOCs are volatile organic compounds from water. So, they are carbon contaminants in wastewater, leachate are contaminated wastewater. The contaminated water may be in industrial wastewater, process water, ground water or leachate. VOC compound contained in the liquid phase through the other side where they are drawn up by a vacuum. A membrane use that preferential partition of the VOC from the water much like an organic phase used in extracting the organics from water sample in liquid liquid extraction. So, for water treatment application you can uh, use either uh, the membrane uh, of a organophilic polymer such as a silicon rubber which exhibits good permeability for organic compounds. So, because it will not swell that is why silicon uh, tube okay, while allowing very limited passage of water. Although permeability through silicon rubber may be 4 times higher for water than VOCs, the preferential partitioning of VOCs at membrane liquid interface provides an overall enrichment of VOC on the permeate side of the membrane. So, most organic compounds are concentrated in the permeate by uh, order of magnitude compared to an aqueous waste. The organics and some water which passes through the membrane are condensed. The condensed permeate often separates into an aqueous and organic phase offering industrial applications and the possibility of recovering the organic fraction. So, this is the schematic representation of VOC removal using a pervaporation process. So, VOC aqueous waste being fed uh, pu being pumped uh, to a heater where it is being heated uh, to a certain temperature then fed back to the pervaporation system where you will get a water which is virtually free of VOC here and you will uh, through a condenser you can uh, separate the VOC here. So, this is another classic example where ethanol is being recovered using a distillation PV hybrid system. So, uh, this is an integrated system in which you have two distillation columns. So, you see you have a 5 percent ethanol is being fed to here. So, you know, by using a two stage distillation column and then a, a final a single pervaporation system we get 99.5 percent ethanol. So, uh, this is a classic example in which two distillation columns and a single pervaporation system is enriching the 5 percent ethanol to 99.5 percent. Okay. So, 
Pervaporation is a green separation process. So, it is a universally accepted term being used worldwide only for those processes which are environmental friendly. So, th those processes we call green separation processes. So, in the context of increasingly stringent legislation in environmental protection rules and regularities, there is an exceptional increase in interest for the development of more environment friendly processes and techniques. Pervaporation is an integral part of the green separation process as it does not need any hazardous or toxic chemicals for separation, but only a selective membrane. It does not discharge any hazardous effluent stream. stream. It is not going to become a part of the global warming. No air, water or ground pollution is involved in the process. A absolutely noise free process. So, the so pervaporation technique does not involve any factor relevant to environmental safety that limits its development or use. So, we can say without much thinking that pervaporation is a greener process, a greener separation process. So, just uh, before we wind up, uh, just advantages of pervaporation process I am just listed out. So, capable of breaking azeotropes, uh, no chance of product contamination, no need of heavy equipments, continuous production system involves low operational pressure, multi stage system can be used, low maintenance cost results in high purity product, environment friendly and pollution free technique, uh, separation of heat sensitive substances involves simple process system schematics, energy saving process involves low operational temperature, flexibility in operating system low operating cost, low capital cost, but everything is not so win win. So, there are some disadvantages also. So, pervaporation separation requires a purified feed. If you are supplying a feed with, with so much of contamination, then pervaporation may not work out and temperature reduction in pervaporation reduces the transmembrane flux. So, th since there is a temperature effect uh, inside the pervaporation system, so the flux gets reduced. So, pervaporation is a, a one system in which both heat and mass transfer uh, appearing simultaneously. So, it is a complex system. So, this is the summary of pervaporation. So, you can go through later on. So, membranes is composite membranes, so, thickness is about 0 0.12 few microns, pore size is it is a non porous membrane, driving force is partial vapor pressure, separation process is of course solution diffusion, membrane materials are elastomeric and glassy polymers and applications is and there are so many applications we have just discussed. So, with this I uh, conclude, thank you very much. So, um, you can refer Mulder and uh, Kenath for today's lecture, most of uh, it is taken from Kenath and uh, if you have any doubt, please feel free to write to me at kmonthi at itg.ac.in in the next class. So, the module 10 lecture 30 will solve some problems based on electrodialysis and pervaporation. So, thank you very much.